Good afternoon, and thank you for joining Senator Murkowski and Senator Sullivan's virtual town hall. My name is Mike Anderson, and I'm tonight's host. In just a few moments, I'll turn it over to the senators for some very brief opening remarks to kick off today's town hall. But before I do, I'd like to take a few mo moments to let everyone know that if you'd like to ask a question during this town hall, please press star 3 at any time, and you'll be connected with a call operator. Again, if you'd like the opportunity to ask a question today, please press star 3 to enter the queue. With that, Senator Murkowski, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mike, and uh, thank you, Dan, for uh, yet another Kella Town Hall. Um, I think I've lost count, but this has been a great opportunity for uh, your, your delegation to connect with Alaskans. So for all of you that are joining us on the call tonight, thank you. We've had some, some focused conversations uh, in the past. We've had individuals from the SBA online talking about the, the Paycheck Protection Program and the EIDL, the Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program. Uh, we've had uh, also the Commissioner of Labor and the Director of Unemployment Insurance uh, that have been with us now for two teletown halls. Tonight, we're just going to do kind of a grab bag of, of things that are on folks' minds. Uh, just very quickly before we get to questions, just give people a little bit of, of a quick update. Um, the, the monies that have been put in place through the CARES Act are, are really starting to get out and, and, and on the ground hitting the streets, so to speak. The economic impact payments, these are the $1,200 um, maximum individual payments as of the 8th of, of May, um, two uh, 277,432 individuals have, have received those, those individual payments. Uh, in terms of the, the PPP approvals, uh, as you know, we have um, had two rounds of, of funding for this very important program for our small businesses. Uh, there have been over 9,500 uh, PPP approvals within the state of Alaska, over $1.2 billion going out in, in, in loans and grants to Alaskans. I think uh, we've, we've enjoyed a level of, of good response to that program. I wish that I could uh, be speak more favorably about uh, the value that Alaskans have received from the economic injury disaster loans. Um, uh, we still struggle. Uh, this, this program is one that, in my view, has not met the needs as, as Congress had intended. But as your delegation, we continue to press on that to make sure that, again, these important loans are, are made available with regard to uh, employment insurance and the updates there. Uh, some of the good news on that is that the uh, pandemic unemployment assistance for the self-employed, the independent contractors, and the gig economy workers started going out this week, um, just a couple days ago. We heard a lot on that last week. People were very, very frustrated because they had filed for unemployment insurance through the state uh, as, as self-employed or um, sole proprietors, and they were saying that they just kept getting rejected by the by the division, and uh, uh, they were told that the system was just now coming online. Be patient. Well, uh, what we've been told is that those checks have started going out, and and folks should be expecting uh, to see those online. And I think that that is important. Here in the Senate, we have been back at work now for for two weeks. Um, it's, uh, it's a different format. We're conducting hearings uh, in kind of a hybrid fashion, some members attending in person, some uh, uh, telephonically or, or by Zoom or, or video. Uh, we've had two hearings um, very keenly focused on, on the matter of testing. This is something that I've been paying close attention to because I think we recognize that in order to successfully reopen our businesses, uh, reopen our communities and get back to school, get kids back to school, whether it's college or, or, um, or uh, K through 12, um, we need to know. Uh, we've got to have some level of, of security and, and certainty. And I think uh, it's pretty clear that that road is going to lead through adequate, adequate testing. Um, 
the the level of innovation that is out there is is pretty considerable. There's been great focus on Alaska, making sure that we're able to meet the needs in a remote, rural, and very large and and oftentimes um, very very costly to access state. We've gotten good cooperation from the administration on that. Um, some have some of the the uh, individuals that are leading the um, the White House task force. Um, initiatives that are all eyes on our issues. We saw the direct uh, the the deputy from Homeland Security, uh, their their highest medical officer up in the state uh, this week, uh, so that he can get a, a better eyes on the, the the situation as to how we are are dealing with uh, with COVID um, nineteen. I think for us in Alaska. Uh, we've got a lot to to be proud of, and how uh, we have worked hard to to keep our numbers down, truly flatten out that curve. And as a consequence, we're in the second phase of a reopening. I have I have reminded people that you've got to remember that when we're talking about reopening an economy that has been shut down uh, due to a pandemic, there is no uh, switch that you just flip on or off. It's it's more akin to a, a dimmer switch. We've got to kind of dial it up, and we need to dial it up um, in 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 concert with the facts on the ground. And uh, we don't want to have to dial it back um, because we have perhaps moved too fast. I think I think what the state is doing right now um, is is solid, and I think it's it's showing that it's demonstrating that in the numbers. With that, I'm going to kick it over to to Dan, who has been. <coughs> an extraordinary partner in, in working through all of these issues um, with not only our colleagues here in the Senate, uh, but in the administration. So thanks to the listeners that are with us, and we look forward to your, your questions. Well, thank you, Lisa, and thanks, everybody. I, um, I just want to begin by um, recognizing that, you know, we continue to go through unprecedented times. We know that... Uh, Many of our fellow Alaskans are hurting, and um, as not just on a you know a perspective from the medical issues, but particularly the economic issues that have been caused by this pandemic. And um, we just really appreciate all of you coming um, on the line tonight, so we can hear from you. I, I have emphasized this before, but you know we work for you. Our teams are on the line right now. Senator Murkowski's and mine. Um, if you can't ask questions, don't get to them. Uh, stay on the line. We'll still be able to take them. And we want to uh, try to help you with whatever the issues you're dealing with. Can't guarantee the outcome you want, but I can guarantee we will put our heart and soul and shoulder into it to try and help. Um, as we've talked about before, a lot of the implementation of the CARES Act is focusing on getting resources to our citizens through different channels so we can weather the storm of this pandemic, both the health storm and the uh, economic and jobs storm. And so that is finally starting to happen, whether it's uh, families getting their economic impact uh, relief checks or the unemployment insurance uh, issues that unfortunately we have so many people unemployed right now, but the CARES Act did look to plus that up very significantly. We've actually made, after a lot of bureaucratic snafus, and I've mentioned that before, a number of uh, good areas of progress with regard to the PPP program, the Paycheck Protection Program, particularly the seasonal uh, business fix. So many of our small businesses are focused on seasonal employment and the way the new treasury regs are written and the way the banks, our banks who are doing a great job in credit unions process this, it enables you to have a much bigger loan based on how many people you would be employing in the summer. Almost all of that finally, and it's been a struggle, is fixed with regard to regulations from the treasury. And as of tonight, there remains still about $100 billion left in the Paycheck Protection Program account. So if you have not applied or if you want to modify your loan based on these seasonal guidance, 
Um, we strongly encourage you to do that. The state has received significant funds, about close to $1.3 billion. Uh, we've been working closely with the governor and our state legislators, Democrats and Republicans, to try to get more flexibility on the ability to spend that money, particularly for lost revenues caused by the pandemic um, for smaller communities uh, and boroughs. Uh, I have legislation that I introduced very bipartisan this week. Uh, I was at a meeting with the president and some of his team, the Secretary of the Treasury, to try to convince them to get behind this because we think that the money that's already gone out the door should be used in a more flexible manner to help uh, our communities that um, that are struggling right now. Uh, there's continued significant funding going to our Alaska Native communities, our hospitals, uh, airports, and we're going to continue to focus on that. Finally, um, we've talked about it before, but a number of our um, fishing communities are going to start to see the disaster relief funds that were in the CARES Act. This was, again, something Senator Murkowski and I uh, got in the bill to take care of our uh, incredible fishermen in our state. Formula just came out. Uh, we, our state, will be getting $50 million, and we will likely look at, you know, that's going to go fast. Uh, and again, we can, um, the state is likely going to uh, be in charge of the distribution of that. And um, that's something we're going to monitor very closely, given that that was a program that the congressional delegation put into the CARES Act. And then, as Senator Murkowski mentioned, uh, in addition to the fisheries in the CARES Act, we do have people on the ground in our different coastal communities, Kodiak, Billingham, I think uh, Cordova, uh, and this is a result of us advocating, you know, literally at the highest levels of the discussion I had with the president and the vice president about the need for uh, making sure our coastal communities, when they're in the fishing season, uh, are ready to have the resources to make sure we don't have the kind of outbreaks that you saw, for example, in South Dakota meatpacking plants and things like that. So. There are people from the federal government on the ground. I've, asked, I've told our community leaders in the coastal communities where they're going to ask for very high levels, shoot the moon, ask for as much resources as we can from these federal officials. I think they're going to be cooperative. And then, the, um, as Senator Murkowski mentioned, Senate's back at work full time. I think that's important. We marked up an infrastructure bill relating to ports and harbors. Uh, clean water for our state. This connected to the highway bill, uh, we think could be a very good infrastructure package for the country. Uh, I'm going to continue to press that. That is something that passed out of the Environment and Public Works Committee on which I sit uh, 21 to 0. So very, very bipartisan. And I hope that can be a basis for phase four legislation that really should help us to start turbocharging our economic recovery, both in Alaska and across the nation. And then finally, we're continuing to work on the issue of energy. Our oil and gas sector has been hit really hard by the pandemic. Senator Murkowski and I led a letter of almost uh, 40 senators and congressmen to the president saying that uh, we want to work with the administration on this issue of some of the big financial institutions uh, openly discriminating against uh, investments in the energy sector, particularly in Alaska. Uh, that's not good for our economy. And I think that uh, these banks are doing it under very dubious legal grounds. So we're going to continue to focus on that. As we know, so many people in our state are dependent on a robust resource development in oil and gas sector and with the many layoffs there and people hurting and families hurting in that sector, we, uh, we're going to put all efforts into making sure that as we get out of the recession caused by this pandemic, it'll be driven by many sectors of the economy, but our resource development and energy sector is one of the most critical. And we can't have banks 
that get a lot of benefits from the federal government, fe- federal deposit insurance. Um, they were bailed out in 2008, 2009. They're going to do very well in implementing the CARES Act. They benefit dramatically from the federal government, and then they turn around and discriminate against the energy sector. That's uh, not appropriate. And w- your delegation, Congressman Young, was on that letter as well. We're going to continue to work on that issue um, for the benefit of our state and our workers and our families that are in that sector. So with that, again, thank you. We look forward to your questions, comments. If we can't find the right answer, we will certainly get back to you. All right. Thank you, Senator Sullivan. Uh, Once again, for any listeners that might have just joined and are looking to ask a question tonight, please press star three to be placed into the queue. Uh, With that, we're going to go to our first question, and we're going to go to Bob in Eagle River, who has a question for the senators. Hi, I guess I just, uh, thanks for taking my call. Um, I guess I have two questions. One, or more of a statement, the uh, the state, I know you've been talking that the, the CARES Act is providing. Lost you, Bob. You there, Bob? Can we find, can we find Bob? Well, it looks like we lost him. I'd just like oh. to know, what are you doing? Go. I'm just asking, what are you both doing to support the president and being able to open up the economy? And please, I, I've heard the light switch, whole thing, light switch. But, you know, frankly, we're going completely without. People are losing everything out here. And we don't have time to wait. You know, most people don't. We're losing, we're losing income. We're, I mean, seven weeks with bringing no money in, it's crazy. This is absolutely insane. And frankly, I've been a lifetime Republican. I voted for both of you in the last election. But at this point, you know, anybody who runs, anybody, any politician who is not doing absolutely everything they can to open up this economy right now, I will walk 10 miles to vote against them in the next time. That's all I got to say. I appreciate your answer. Well, and that's, that's fair enough, Bob, because what you're saying is reflecting the the just the, the the anger, the fear, the frustration um, that that so many feel. You know, we're 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 talking to businesses every day that um, these are folks that have spent their whole lives building something, and and it's been a healthy business, and they literally are are told um, by by their government that. Um, in order to protect health and safety, you have to to close your establishment. And this is this is as as we all recognize an unprecedented situation. So how we get back to work, how we reopen, is something that all of us, from the president right on down to your 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 mayor and and your your city assemblyman. This is what all of us need to be working on every day to be doing. And I think we recognize we've got two fronts that we've got to be dealing with. You you have you have a, a health threat, and some may say, well, it hasn't touched me, and so therefore, um, uh, therefore, it is not uh, it's not significant. Uh, in fairness. It has it has touched this country in ways that are unprecedented. It's, it is touching um, families that uh, have have done everything right, and and yet they are um, their 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 health is compromised. Losses are uh, lives are lost. In Alaska, I think we have worked aggressively. I I, I credit Governor Dunleavy for for moving quickly to uh, to respond in a manner that was hard. Um, but I think we've seen that reflected in, in the limited number of cases that we have seen, the way that we have been able to rapidly respond when we do have an incident in a community where it's, it is isolated and, um, and it doesn't spread. But that, that has cost us in terms of, of revenues and economic loss. So everything that we're doing going forward needs to be how we get the economy back open, uh, but we also recognize that we have to have to do it it safely. And so, 
There is guidance out there. None of us like, like to be told what to do. Um, we all, we're pretty independent in Alaska and, and, and feel like we can be responsible for ourselves. But in fairness, uh, virus and disease don't care whether or not you're being responsible. They don't care whether uh, you're a supporter of the president or not a supporter of the president. Um, there's a vulnerability here and how we balance the, 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 the public safety uh, with, with our economic security is, is an extraordinary, extraordinary challenge. And, and so how we, how we uh, follow responsibly the precautions that have been put in place while we aggressively work to, to resume our businesses and get our, get our economy back on our feet. This is what we are all challenged to do every single day. And I am working with our president and with our governor and with our medical officials and with our delegation and with our mayors and with every single member in the community to get to that place. So, Bob, I would just add, you know, in terms of the ultimate decision, if you look at the Constitution, this is uh, the Tenth Amendment is, to me, makes this very much on the issue of opening the economy, a decision that governors and mayors throughout the country are going to be the ones most responsible for making that call. Alaska is not New York City. It's not New Jersey. And um, that's why governors are making the call in different areas. I think the federal government, they provide guidance, as you've seen in the CARES Act. We try to provide resources. We're certainly focused on things to try to help make the economy open sooner, like testing. But to your broader point, more generally, you know, I do think there is this idea that we were talking about flattening the curve with regard to the virus. So your medical um, system would not be overwhelmed. And I think most states have done that successfully. But if you flatten the curve and flatten the economy permanently, the damage to people uh, could be even worse. So I'm not disagreeing with what you're saying at all. My own view, and again, this is more and I've talked to the governor about this. this. is more his call, not the federal government's call. But one thing I think that um, is going to be important as we get data, more and more data, it's going to help us with regard to opening the economy. So what's an example of that? When you look at across states, who the most vulnerable uh, populations are, it is unequivocally, according to the data, uh, the elderly with regard to this virus. It's not young people. It's people in their mid to late 70s and 80s who are the most vulnerable. So can you start to more aggressively open the economy while saying to that group of people, you need to continue to hunker down? Uh, I think those are the kind of decisions, again, they're going to be made by governors, by uh, mayors, but I think those are the kind of decisions we can um, we can start making that make sense to get the economy open and while still trying to keep people safe from a health perspective. So the one thing, though, that you start to, you're starting to see in certain places, I don't think we're seeing in Alaska, is a little bit of moving the goalposts where we've gone from flattening the curve to making sure our healthcare system doesn't get overwhelmed. We get the capacity ready to deal with that. And now you're kind of seeing certain places maybe are indicating, well, we got to stay shut down because we can't have anyone ever get the virus. Well, that was not the original intent of the shutdowns. And so I would not be supportive of that. Well, we got to stay shut down until we get a vaccination. That was also not the intent of the shutdowns. So we're, the goalposts are being moved to extend these shutdowns. I would disagree with that. Uh, that's happening in certain parts of the country. I don't think it's happening in Alaska, but the data and um, 
you know, getting our economy going again are things that I think are actually very, very important. All right, thanks, Senators. Next up, we're going to go to Mac in Prince of Wales Island, who's got a question. Hi, thank you. Um, and first of all, I do want to thank uh, both the Senators and uh, Congressman Don Young. I know he's not on the call, but uh, he'll get the word. But for your help with the PPP um, issues we were having with the SBA communicating with our banks, you've gotten several emails from me in the last couple of weeks from our group and we have noticed that within hours sometimes uh, at least by the next day all of a sudden things started to happen and we appreciate that there's still one thing left with a with the uh, uh, seasonal modifications and that has to do with the eight week uh, period that we're allowed to spend the money right now we can't spend it past about June 15th and yet our biggest expenditures are going to come after that, usually in July and August. So that one still needs to be squared away. And uh, uh, you heard from me this morning on that, but uh, I'm sure you're working on it. If the, if you get the kind of results you got before, we'll be very appreciative. The one other thing is the uh, the idle, uh, the EIDL, and I think uh, Senator Murkowski um, expressed some frustration with that we're hearing now that the max limit is only going to be $150,000 where it started out I think a million or maybe more maybe mm -hmm. even two million and um, $150,000 is five days of operating for us and we're not a big operation so that's not going to do us much good and uh, that's all I have and thank you so Mac, thanks for that, and uh, it's, it's good to know that you've you've uh, seen um, uh, greater responsiveness when it comes to the PPP. So with with regards to the EIDL, uh, again, um, I, I have been really disappointed in how this program has has rolled out. Um, I think there have been conflicting messages that have been provided to to those who are are applicants. Uh, in fact, they've been conflicting messages. To, to those uh, of us in the Congress. And so we know what it is that we passed, and then when we see uh, it implemented or guidance given in a way that was clearly not the intent, uh, it is beyond uh, frustrating. So you, you mentioned this, uh, this, this kind of moving the goalposts, if you will, in terms of what the loan amount is. It was uh, to be uh, an amount not to exceed $2 million in terms of the loan. And what has been happening is, is we've seen it reported um, and, and we've heard uh, people saying that they have been told that uh, it's being capped at, at 150000 I had a conversation specifically with the head of uh, SBA who implements um, the, uh, the, the, uh, the loan program, the EIDL loan program for Region 10, which is, is where Alaska is. We had this conversation just a half an hour before uh, last Thursday's Teletown Hall because I wanted to get clarification from him. He assured me that, in fact, uh, it was not a, a capped limit, but what they had been advised to do within, uh, within the, the SBA, within the agency, was to look specifically to the, the, the capital uh, the, the, the operating costs of respective businesses when they requested the loans and to, uh, to, to, to basically be judicious with, with the amount of the loan that they were providing. And, and yet he, he said there is, no, there is no firm limit at 150000 So I, I've sought greater clarity um, than just that assurance from him because, again, we see it uh, reported in, in, in throughout the media. We hear from it directly, and and in fairness, we have heard from from some others who uh, were awarded loans in excess of 150,000. So some of that is anecdotal. In other words, it's not it's not the the clarity that we need on this program. Um, one of the problems that we're facing right now, though is when we put in place the second round of funding for the EIDL, we 
allowed for an expansion of that program to accommodate agriculture businesses, which apparently um, had not been able to access readily the, re- the, the loans in the, in the first round. Fair enough. But what comes back then when they finally do open up the, the, the portal for application of loans, we now find out that they are taking only agriculture business loans in this second round until they have had an opportunity to weigh in. So in other words, they have tipped the scale in, in favor of, of, of ag businesses. And I don't have anything against agriculture businesses at all. They deserve to have an opportunity for these loans as well. But what you have then done is you have pushed everybody else to the back of the line. So again, contrary to the intent of Congress, um, Senator Sullivan just mentioned in, in his opening remarks, we've, we've, had, we've had some fits and starts as we have worked through these programs. And as Alaskans, you have weighed in and you've shared with us the concerns that you have, the issues, um, and we've tried to address them one-on-one, whether it's the seasonal worker, whether it's the 1099 with the fishermen, or as you point out so, so clearly, um, the time limits within which you have to use these funds is extraordinarily limited. And so making sure that there's greater flexibility to these programs so that it meets the needs of our small businesses is what we're continuing to try to do. So I think it's important for you to know that as Dan has mentioned, there, there are still resources within the funds to, um, that we can tap into. That's important. But on our end, we need to be continuing to, to press for greater flexibility um, within the guidance that has already been outlined because that's where the limiting factor has been. Um, we haven't talked about the fact that the, that the House is going to vote tomorrow on a proposal uh, that's pretty dang expensive. I haven't spent a lot of my time trying to figure out what is in their $3 trillion package, but I understand that when it comes to the small business loans, um, which we have seen a huge need um, and a huge level of support for, uh, that, they, that they don't seek to, to build on, on uh, the capacity of those, of those small business loans. So um, you know, that's a subject of another discussion, but know that as we're talking to Alaskans and as we look at uh, – at the makeup of our business community, 99% of the businesses in Alaska qualify as small businesses. So when I think about ways that we reopen the economy, that when we help those who have been impacted by this, this economic uh, uh, pandemic that we're in, we need to do more to make sure that we're being responsive with, with regards to providing assist for our small businesses. So Mac, I'll just add to that, you know, on the, PPP seasonal fix that was uh, that was your delegation that drove that change with the Secretary of the Treasury and his team, given how important our seasonal businesses are. And you know, again, this none of this has gone up without a hitch. There's been all kinds of snafus, and you guys bump up against the bureaucratic nature of some of these federal agencies. A uh, big part of our job is to go in and kind of you know, uh, kick in the doors to try to fix it with the with the federal agencies. We have had close to 10,000 PPP loans uh, at about 1.3 billion in the state. And even finally on the EIDL loan, as uh, Lisa's mentioned, it's been a frustration, you know, in terms of the advances that come from that. And that's kind of like a grant, uh, over 7,000, at close to $25 million to small businesses. But the issue that you mentioned, uh, eight weeks, um, I was actually in a meeting uh, with the president and the secretary of the treasury a couple of days ago. That topic came up, um, but that need, that cannot be fixed by a reg. That would have to be fixed. That would have to be fixed uh, through legislation but I still think uh, there's opportunities there because a number of small businesses throughout the country, not just in Alaska, have talked about the uh, eight-week period as being too short. 
And again, when we put this CARES Act together, uh, none of us had a crystal ball. And uh, that was what we thought was going to help us get through the pandemic. But as you know, the economic uh, impact is enormously negative right now for our state and our country. And so taking a look at that uh, is something we've been discussing with the Treasury and we can keep you posted on how that goes. It might be a little more challenging simply because it's not going to come through a Treasury reg. They have the authority to fix that seasonal issue that mattered to so many Alaskans. This one would clearly have to be fixed, not through regulation, but through a statutory change. Thank you, Senators. Next up is Dr. Linda Freeman from Anchorage, who's got a question. Hello. Um, yes, I have written, um, Lisa and Dan, both to both of you, and thank you for getting back with me about the concerns of uh, mental health for Alaskans mm -hmm. and um, the fact that we have some of our health trusts that are going to not honor telehealth for mental health for most of their codes uh, relatively soon. The good news is we actually had they, they are honoring it right now during COVID, and one, of, one and possibly two health trusts are actually changing their contracts going forth to assure that telehealth will be allowed to people for mental health. But interestingly enough, we just got notice that on June 4th, they're going to discontinue covering many of the telehealth codes for mental health for the state of hmm. Alaska for their employees. And, and I just want to comment that, you know, financially in every other way, this, this is not a good approach. This is for vulnerable people, and we can save money and keep them healthier by not cutting off their mental health um, care. And I wonder if you could just encourage the governor to take a look at that, because I think sometimes I get the sense that they don't understand what their TPA is actually doing. They think there's more services than are actually being allowed. Can you advise me or give me any thoughts on that? Both of you, please. Well, Dr. Freeman, I I will uh, just start off by by uh, assuring you that this is an issue that um, we have been following very very carefully, as as we think about the health consequences of 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 COVID and and what it means. Um, you know, you think about those that have been impacted by by the virus, but I think we recognize that with any disaster with any disaster you have a you have a follow-on uh, impact um, that uh, really uh, should we should be we should be very concerned about um, our the overall impact to mental and behavioral health issues and and again I don't, I don't care whether we're talking about uh, an, an, an earthquake, floods, or or um, uh, a, a a global health pandemic. I think we recognize that uh, the mental health issues are something that we must pay attention to, and and because it is more of a a a, a more silent threat uh, to to our, our our health or less visible. Um, sometimes we, we, we put that, uh, we put that to the back and it cannot be. I think one of the things that we have learned, um, from, from how quickly we were impacted, uh, by, by, uh, the, 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 the coronavirus and, um, the economic consequences that have come is we have learned to very quickly turn to the assets that we have around us to deal with our health issues, including our mental health issues, and that's the benefits of telehealth. And I think it has opened the eyes and changed the minds of, of many in other parts of the country for whom uh, uh, distance delivery um, of, of, of healthcare has been a foreign concept in Alaska we're far, we have far greater ease with it. We've been doing it um, uh, really exceptionally well in many of our outlying areas uh, through the IHS system, through the VA system. We've really been, we've, we've been running point on this for a long while and basically demonstrating how it's doing. But we've always been tripped up by, by the reimbursement side of it. Now, 
Uh, others are seeing the benefit. They're seeing how they can deliver a level of health care in a way that is very non-traditional, but that works and, and recognizing that, okay, in order to make it work further, you have to allow for, for, for the rational reimbursement. So I think, I think we're going to see this changing um, uh, the way uh, that, that whether it is it's, it's mental health or other, uh, other opportunities for deli- ways of delivery of, of health care. I think you're going to see this change as a consequence of what we have been dealing with with this pandemic. We have to make sure, though, that the reimbursements um, make sense. And, and so what you provided me in terms of a June 4 cutoff is, is news. I'll certainly look into it, and we'll be able to report back to you. So I appreciate you bringing it up. And, Linda, let me just add that, um, you know, the, on the telehealth side, we've been throughout this process, and as I think a lot of you know, um, you, you passed the CARES Act, but then the implementation has been a huge part of what we've been doing. And, and so many of the ideas that we've gotten with our engagement with the federal agencies is through these kind of meetings and other uh, conference calls that Senator Murkowski and I have done. So we we did advocate hard to get the um, our federally qualified health centers added to uh, qualified telehealth providers. You know, we have almost 10% of all the community health centers in the country in our state. And then we work with the Trump administration to add the um, Alaska specific CPT codes that are um, uh, uh, to enable hospitals to provide telehealth. So I do, uh, I do. But when you talk about mental health, I'm going to do. And I, you know, we've done seven of these, and I haven't really uh, done this none of yet. But I, I do want to do a shout out to my uh, senior senator here, um, Lisa Murkowski, on the mental health issues, not just for Alaska, but across the country. Um, as you can imagine, she and I do a lot of what we call in the Marine Corps port starboard work. I'll focus on certain issues. She focuses on other issues. Uh, She's been a great leader on mental health issues and uh, raises it everywhere, every venue. And I think the combo of the telehealth and mental health challenges that we're seeing coming out of this pandemic, if there's one silver lining, it's going to be that our country is going to be more committed uh, to these issues. And I think that'll be a good thing but if you have additional ideas on it, we'd love to hear from you on it. Thanks. Thanks, Senator. Next up, we're going to go to Gerald and Chugiak, who's got a question. Yes, Senators. Um, first of all, I want to express a real appreciation. i actually encouraged by the things that I'm hearing today. Uh, Dan, the idea of the, the uh, moving the goalpost, uh, I can't express enough to uh, hear your support in that aspect. I'm a commercial fisherman in Bristol Bay. Um, I'm 72 years old. I'm really concerned for the fear factor that that I think is being pumped. If I could, I really wish there was a way to get rid of NPR because I recognize that uh, uh, they very effectively put in fear. My concern is uh, as we go into this fishery, there's rules and regulations that are, in my estimation, some of them absolutely ridiculous. And I'm hoping that there's some way here to have the rules and regulations flexible. We've still got a month or more before that fishery starts. And, and I hope that there is some way or somebody, a uh, fish star or somebody, can look at these ridiculous regulations you know, some of them such things as can you imagine keeping six feet away from another person on a 32 foot where your living area is 10 feet across? Um, I don't know what could be done in that area. I just guess I'd like to see some flexibility. And, um, you know, I recognize there's issues for the processors. I know that the processors are their ability to function this year is going to be affected 15, maybe 20 percent getting um getting their workers in, if their workers aren't U.S. citizens. It's a slug of things here. But anyway, um, 
the big thing right now is is there really anything that we can do to uh, diminish the fear factor? Um, it seems like this is being pumped. You know, we're not dealing with the same thing that happened here in uh, the 1930s. Uh, Alaskans now are um, most even natives, and I'm part native, have traveled to and from Anchorage. It's just not the same. But I see that fear factor, and, and I, I don't know what can be done to take and get combat that, you know, that hysteria that's out there. Well, I'll jump in here, Gerald, and, and thanks uh, for for listening and, and your comments. I think they're, they're, they're certainly comments that we're hearing from a lot of folks. And, um, you know, as Senator Murkowski and I both mentioned, I think actually today in Bristol Bay, uh, the federal officials that we strongly encouraged, literally from the president on down, to um, – get out to our fishing communities to help uh, with regard to the season. And as you know, that's a balance. That's a balance primarily between the state and the local communities. But we think, and one of the reasons we've been really pressing this, is that if you do get a lot of resources, so for example, you know, the uh, this uh, Admiral, Admiral Greer, who is the top guy in the federal government in terms of testing, um, he is, you know, committed to sending a, a big surge of tests to our uh, different um, fishing communities. I think that's one way to help address uh, what you've been referring to as the fear factor. I also think, and some people disagree with me, but what I've been encouraging our state and local officials to do, if the federal government has excess capacity with regard to, say, field hospitals, then let's Let's ask the feds to bring some field hospitals up. Hopefully we don't need them. But again, if you have some kind of outbreak in a, in a plant, um, a fish processing plant, then you have capacity to deal with it. So part of, I think, dealing with the fear factor is, um, is making sure the resources are out there so the local community feels it's supported and there can be a balance between uh, the concerns that uh, people have with regard to health and catching the COVID uh, virus, but also the concerns that people have about having, and you know, it was mentioned um, earlier in the call, uh, Bob, that the concerns about what happens to people and their health and their well being and their mental health if they're. Uh, jobs and their economy um, get crushed. So I think it's a combination. Um, I will say more broadly, this is a discussion I had with a, a, a senior official at the Federal Reserve. So the, you know, the Fed really is looking at the broader U.S. economy and how we're going to come out of this. And they look at historical data. They look at previous pandemics, including the Spanish flu. And one of the things this very senior Federal Reserve official said to me was exactly what you just said, that, you know, people on th during this pandemic have stayed home, they've hunkered down, they've watched TV, uh, which has usually been focused on kind of New York and New Jersey, where this has been really bad. And, you know, they're scared to walk out of their house because they think they might catch it and die. Well, that's highly unlikely that that would happen. So there is this element, and I don't want to downplay the issue of people's health because it's so important, but there is this element that um, even at the highest levels of the Federal Reserve, they're looking exactly at the question that you are talking about. And if people um, are scared to leave their homes, it's going to be difficult to get this economy started up again. So that's one of the reasons I told the leadership of the Senate that we should be back here. We should be working. We can work. We can hold hearings. We can have meetings and, you know, get get the economy back to work while doing it responsibly. One more thing on regulations that we did work on, uh, you know, these uh, NIMS um, observers, on our fishing vessels, particularly the small ones, 
you may have seen that we uh, worked really hard with NIMS to get rid of that reg, at least for now. Every two weeks they review it, but right now on our vests, on our smaller fishing vessels, there's no need for a, um, an observer. And we made the argument, just like you made, doesn't make sense. These are small boats. Um, they're crowded. We don't need an additional person on it, particularly if we're supposed to be doing social distancing. So we don't think there should be uh, observers on our fishing vessels right now. Uh, they agreed with us. And I think that's one example where, you know, addressing these regs, some of which make no sense even when we don't have a pandemic, are things that we can do to help lessen the burden. So, Gerald, let me just be real quick, because I know we want to get on to some other questions here, but um, you ask a, a great question about, you know, how how we can work to reduce that, that fear and um, uh, really be able to to engage in, in, in a fisheries. Um, the Bristol Bay fishery out there is pretty significant. Um, not only not only jobs for, for, for so many Alaskans, but a great source of protein for, for the world out there. And uh, we want to be able to do it. I, I, I'll tell you, I think one of the ways forward is to, to demonstrate how we are already leading in, in, a, in, a, in a way um, that demonstrates our level of preparedness. And I think all you need to do is look to what is happening beginning today in Cordova. Today is the opening day of the Copper River Run. Um, you know, pretty significant fishery for, for a small community there. Uh, but you, you have, we, we have seen kind of put in place a, a protocol and um, it's, it's not entirely easy. I, I, I understand that and I certainly certainly get what you're saying about how do you social distance when you're when you're on a small fishing vessel it's just it's not it's not realistic you know that we know that um, and so what what do we put in place to make sure that you've got a level of pr protections and precautions so that if something does happen if the virus does hit we can respond well we had kind of a dry run on that in Cordova um, you've got a plan where you bring in folks from the outside uh, into a community that's been pretty well isolated. They had zero cases of, of coronavirus in Cordova um, un, until folks started get, getting ready for the season. You've got a machinist that comes up from outside. Uh, he, he did the test in Seattle as he was supposed to. He comes back in. They pick him up at the airport. They take him directly to, to Ocean Beauty's uh, facility there. They administer yet another test. Unfortunately, it takes a couple of days to get the test back. He comes back. He now tests positive. What do they do? They isolate everybody else. They, they make sure that they have, have traced who else he has, has come in contact with. And, and we haven't seen another, another uh, positive case out of that community. They're moving forward and, and, um, not only uh, gearing up within the, the the processing facility there at Ocean Beauty, but all of the other processors. You've got all of your independent fishermen that are coming in. Everybody knows what what the drill is, and it is different, yes. But what they're doing is they're demonstrating that in a small, isolated community with a with a hospital that is pretty limited. The mayor tells me that he has six available beds in case something happens. That's not a lot. But what they've got is they've got testing in place and they have a response plan. And, and what I think they're going to do is they're going to demonstrate that, yeah, we got this. It's, it's called preparation. And hopefully we don't need half of it. We don't need a tenth of what we have put in place. But what we'll be able to do is we'll be able to have a fishery. We'll be able to keep fishermen from, from losing their boats because they're going to be able to get out. They're going to be able to fish the season. They're going to be able to deliver their fish. They're going to be able to get good money for it. They're going to be able to pay their boat mortgages or house mortgages and pay their crew. And, and they're going to be safe. And the community is going to be safe as well. And so this is how you eliminate the fear is you do what Alaskans do. 
we we come together. We're smart. We we pay attention. Um, we're we're dealing with some regulations right now that most of us really wish we didn't have to, but I think we're I think we're doing it in a way that's going to demonstrate you can achieve this balance that Senator Sullivan has mentioned a couple times now, where you're protecting health and safety. You're not able to eliminate everything. We cannot do that, and we're not guaranteeing that we're doing it. But what we are doing is we're being responsible. We're being able to return to to our local economies and and provide a resource and 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 the jobs and the sustainment of the community as well, while making sure that uh, that we're um, uh, we're being responsible with our health precautions. So let's demonstrate that it can be done. And, and move forward. And I think Alaska is, is in a good, good position to be a model for the rest of the country here. Thanks, Senator. Next up, we're going to go to Melanie and Homer, who has a question for the senators. Yes, uh, it's the right Melanie. I'm in Palmer, not Homer. Uh, but at any rate, I just have a real quick question, and that is, uh, can you look into uh, seeing about the feds opening up their offices because I need to get something done with Social Security as well as the IRS. And I can't get through um, on the Social Security end. You sit on hold for two hours and then you get bumped to the lower 48. Um, Anchorage does not pick it up their phones and you can't make appointments or anything and I need to see them in person. And then my son needs to call the IRS about something and they don't pick up either. So I was wondering if you could look into that. I mean, the state offices are open, and they just do appointments. They're pretty effective, but not so with the feds. So I just wanted to make you aware of it. Okay, Melanie, I am going to uh, I'm going to make sure that um, that our office uh, gets in contact with you. Um, the Anchorage office there is two seven one three seven three five. Sherry mm-hmm. Edwards. Sherry is the woman that you want to talk to. Um, she is my uh, uh, extraordinary constituent case director um, who will be able to to get you through to Social Security and IRS. I know Dan has his extraordinary staff that uh, are dedicated to the same thing, but um, uh, we can help connect you. Okay, and that was uh, Sherry at 271-3735, is that correct? You got it. Okay, what you'll thank get, you so much. You'll get it. You'll get a message. You'll get an answering machine that that because uh, our offices are are not being staffed right now, but but staff monitor that phone every day, and okay. so uh, we will get that message and and have her respond to you. Okay. Thank you so much. Next up, we're going to go to Nan and Denali Park, who's got a question for the senators. Can't hear. Are you there, Nan? Can you hear me? No. Oh, boy. There you go. There you go. Okay. Oh, great. Thank you. Thank you, both of you, for being so awesome and making this available to people. Um, I am one of the many, many people in the Denali Bureau who has seasonal employment as a, my particular instance is as a wilderness guide, and I work for five different employers and two different nonprofits, and um, everything has been canceled for this summer, as every one in Alaska realizes the tourism season is not happening, and uh, it just you know, part of me feels like I don't want to apply for unemployment when there's others that may need it more than I. But I also, like, I am so overwhelmed by the process that it is really intimidating to think there's uh, any chance of getting a little reimbursement. And because I work for so many different entities and I'm, I'm just wondering if, you know, there's a way to access 
just even a minimal amount of money for those of us that rely on tips for the majority of our seasonal income and how you equate any of that. So, Nan, may, maybe I can jump in here, um, kind of like what Senator Murkowski did uh, on the last call with Melanie. Uh, my office, you know, is very good at the casework. We'd be glad to be able to help. The number there in Anchorage is 271-5915. And, um, you know, we've heard on a number of these town hall uh, events that we've done, kind of a similar theme to, to what you mentioned. You know, we are a strong, proud uh, group of people in Alaska, and we've heard people say, "Well, I'm, I'm not sure I want to do this. I've never done it before. I don't want to. I don't want government help." And um, uh, you know, my reaction to that is this isn't some kind of handout. It's not anything you did. This is a, I would just call this a business or employment interruption insurance. You know, we got hit with something that's more akin to a natural disaster or a war, not something that somebody did. And I think that it's the role of the federal government to step in, provide a bridge to people or small businesses. You know, incidentally, and again, my my team can help you with this, wages, commissions, tips are all included in uh, PPP loan calculations. So even things like tips are things that, you know, if you're talking about that, we can look at different options for you. So I think that's the way, just my own perspective, to think about it. Um, but we'd be glad to help you through, you know, the different options and different federal programs that are out there to try to help individuals like yourself get through what is a challenging time for everybody. And uh, we'd, we'd be uh, honored to help you. Well, I, I really appreciate that empathetic <laughs> uh, response. I, I think some of us feel like, there might be others that are more deserving and we want to make sure we're not taking away. I mean, I've lived here a long time. I own my home. I've been in Alaska for 41 years and, and I've been fortunate to not have to dip into any kind of federal handout and, and boy, but you know, so this is my first time looking at the process and it's like, Holy my God, you know, it's just so complicated and I guess what primarily I'd like to say, if there's any way that the both of you can make it way more straightforward and not uh, so intimidating to a, a lot of people. I mean, luckily I speak English, I read English, and I've grown up and lived here for many years, but... Um, it is an intimidating process, and I hope that it can be refined so that it's accessible, particularly to people that are seriously in need. And I also would love it if, you know, I I live just 10 miles south of Denali Park. I go to the Denali Park Post Office, and there's all these really straightforward requests of wearing a mask and standing at least six feet away from the person in front of you and only two people in, you know, in the post office at the same time. And then you go to the post office north or south of us and it's total, uh, totally a different scenario. And it, I think, would be really helpful and gratifying to have all of us feel like we know it's a level playing field, and everybody abides by the same, you know, very simplistic directive of wear a mask, respect the people that are working for you, and I, I would really appreciate it if the governor, um, I think it's awesome the way Alaska has dealt with this, but if there was just a really seriously straightforward directed of who, uh, how to behave in public. And maybe it's not just a recommendation.
situation, but it is, um, you know, something stronger than that. I'm not big on serious regulations, but there's a a lot of diverse interpretations of what all this is, and I uh, think it's seriously important to keep our communities, especially those communities that might see a lot of visitors this summer, have some very concise directions on how to behave and uh, perform in a public (laughs) area. But anyway. Well, Nan, you've you've raised a lot of a lot of things there. In addition um, uh, to your earlier uh, question to, to that Senator Sullivan responded to, and I, I I hear what you're saying about about the guidance. Uh, you hear guidance coming out at the federal level. You have it at the state level. You have it at the local level, and um, and that can lead to its own. Uh, its own confusion. Um, uh, I do think we we need to recognize that um, the guidance that that is out there, the directives that are there, uh, are trying to recognize the conditions on the ground. Um, so, uh, as as you see um, things improve, and in one community, it might not be the same in another community. Uh, or, or the resources might not be as, as much in one community that uh, uh, that might make a distinction as to to the to the the guidance that is is there. And so I, I do uh, empathize with with um, your concern about um, it doesn't seem that there's a, a to be a consistent level. I, I also recognize that this is evolving. Um, what has been put in place uh, by the governor um, in terms of how we move from one phase to another is is looking at and assessing conditions on the ground. And so it is not static. Um, so it 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 is it is something that we all need to um, be be paying attention to not only what's happening, um, with, within the state, but but more specifically within our own area, and while we recognize that these are uh, that, that this is guidance here, I think out of of respect uh, to to others and and their uh, situation, um, I may feel that I am perfectly healthy and I'm not uh, I'm not exposing anybody to. Uh, to anything because I think I'm okay, but I'm not sure that I'm okay. And I look at you and you're okay, but I don't know whether you live with somebody who is 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 elderly and has a, a health complication, or or a young person who is um, uh, has has health issues. I think we all uh, have been moving cautiously and respectfully towards one another. Uh, I do believe that how we have uh, tried to work within our state, respecting the the guidance of of our medical professionals, um, uh, has been one of the reasons why um, why we have uh, been able to to reduce um, this this curve and 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 really be able to move uh, more readily uh, than many many states out there. Um, uh, to get to that place where we all want to be, which is, which is having um, our businesses back open, kids being able to to be back in school, and uh, to to be able to have a, a level of of mobility and um, and social interaction that I know we all we all long for. So we're working towards it, and I think Alaskans are doing a, a very good job. Um, I'm proud of the efforts. I know it has been, we know it has been very, very, very hard, but um, I think we are starting to see uh, some some very strong progress in Alaska, and, and that's to be recognized. 
Thank you, Senator Murkowski. We've gone way over time tonight, so for those that called in, we appreciate your participation. Uh, if you wanted to ask a question for the senators tonight but you weren't able to, please stay, hang on the line afterwards, and you'll be prompted to leave a message, and, I'll, and our offices will work to get you an answer. With that, have a great evening, stay safe, and good night. Thank you all. Thank you, everybody.